So, I've been promising this video for months now. I mean, good gosh, I started it last year. Uh, and uh, I was it was initially just going to be a break from the Evolution of Alien Plants video, which, to be honest, I'm really not that fond of. But uh, after working so long on it, it ended up being overambitious, and the art is a little outdated. I'm not a huge fan of the scripts. I think there are scientific ac or scientific details that I missed. And so after a long while of trying to work on it, but having no motivation to get any progress done, I decided to finally cancel it. So I edited the video little, so that way it at least feels complete. But unfortunately, I had a abandon the project. So, here's the video. Uh, I'm sorry about canceling it, but it gives me more time to work on other things that are more competently made. So, bye. Afterman, Zoology of the Future is one of the first official speculative evolution books written. Published in 1981 by Scottish geologist and paleontologist Dougal Dixon, it is set 50 million years into the future, after a mass extinction event that wiped out man and many other species. After Man was a success in the US, UK, and Japan, and it was the book that inspired the speculative evolution genre. The book features a wide array of unique organisms, from large piscivorous telpids, to large hoofed rabbits that take the ecological niches of ungulates. Of one lineage the book shows in particular are large apex predatory rats like the phalanx who live in temperate forests, to its close relatives like the rapide, the temperate ravine, the jansen, and the aquatic pantheron. These are said to be descendants of rats introduced worldwide by humans that took the ecological niches of carnivorans after their extinction, and have thus converged onto similar forms. The idea of carnivorous rats, or rodents in general, has fascinated audiences of this genre. But how plausible is this idea? And if it is, how could such organisms evolve? What can we use to make an educated guess on what carnivorous rodents will look like? To answer each of these questions, we're going to take three steps. First, we'll analyze the taxonomy of rodents. Then, we explore the plausibility of carnivorous rodents. And finally, we speculate what they would look like, and how they would evolve based on certain taxonomic lineages and what lineage of rats we choose. Both rodents and lagomorphs are grouped within goliaths, which are characterized by having incisors that lack roots and grow continuously, a lack of canine teeth, and reduced premolars. This gives goliaths a distinguishable distemma. The lagomorphs are also distinguished from rodents based on their extra pair of teeth, padless feet, and are strictly herbivorous. But the most diverse order of goliaths, or mammals in general, are the rodents. Rodents encompass at least 40% of all documented mammal species, nearly half of all mammals. However, it is their sheer diversity that has made them so hard to classify. Because they are a monophyletic group, there is a variety of parallel evolution observed within them. Because many rodent lineages have adapted to similar niches, and have thus converged on the same adaptations because of it. So initially, it was strongly debated on their taxonomy, as they were grouped based on morphology. Back in 1855, German-Russian naturalist Jonathan Frederick von Brandt proposed Rodentia to be grouped into three suborders, Securomorpha, Mystricomorpha, and Myomorpha. These groups were based on the zygomasoteric system, a system that describes the placement of the masseter muscles and the maxillary fossa. <laughs> Securomorphy is more efficient at gnawing, Hystricomorphy is more efficient at chewing, and Myomorphy is efficient at both. All of which are derived from ancestral rodents with Protogomorphy. But as of recently, we begin relying on molecular phylogeny, which gives us a better understanding of the taxonomy of Rodentia than morphology. Rodentia is now grouped under five suborders, with the addition of Castoromorpha and Anomaluromorpha. The suborder Securomorpha contains squirrels and mountain beavers, Hysterichomorpha contains capybaras, porcupines, and guinea pigs. Gastoromorpha contains beavers and kangaroo rats. 
Anomaleromorpha contains scaly tailed squirrels and the Zincarella, and Myomorpha contains rats, mice, gerbils, etc. Phylogenetic studies also show a closer relation between Castoromorpha, Anomaleromorpha, to Myomorpha than Hystricomorpha. <laughs> bring this up because, one, the term rat is a rather non-specific taxonomic term, as the only true rats are within the genus Rattus, which are specifically within the family Myridae, the superfamily Myridia, and the suborder Mitomorpha. But the term rat is also applied to kangaroo rats and pack rats. But I also bring this up to discuss carnivorous rodents do exist. Grasshopper mice, which are members of Crasididae, feed on arthropods. Rincomis are members of Myridae native to the Philippines and are specialized vermivores, bearing needle-like teeth and delicate jaws. The Weomis mamasi, native to Indonesian islands, feeds on aquatic invertebrates with the help of long whiskers and so on. But, at the same time, carnivorous rodents aren't just limited to small insectivores. The Rakali, Hydromis, is a genus of aquatic myrids native to Australia and Tasmania. They are streamlined, have partially red feet, and their tails are used as a rudder for swimming. And they're around 9.5 to 14.6 inches in length, with males being slightly larger than females. However, they are predominantly carnivorous, not only feeding on aquatic crustaceans and shellfish, but they also feed on turtles, birds, bats, mice, eggs, fish, and frogs. In fact, they are keen in reducing invasive populations of cane toads by avoiding their toxic glands by flipping them on their backs and eating their hearts and liver but they've also been shown to have immunity against their poison. These are carnivorous rodents, both small and large. However, that's not what audiences are looking for in speculative evolution. What we're looking for are large apex predators that take down large prey, with sharp incisors that resemble canines and wolf or lion-like bodies. But can we conclude the idea of apex predator rats are plausible based on these examples? The lack of large carnivorous rodents is less so because rodents just aren't equipped for carnivory, but rather due to mammalian competition. For example, water rats are found in the New World lineage, Chrysididae, and the Old World lineage, Myridae, with all New World water rats belonging to Stigmodontidae. But despite this, water rats are not found in tropical Asia or non-tropical climates due to competition with amphibious shrews. Another example is a multitude of carnivorous species native to Indonesian islands. Like Rikomis, Shrew Mice, and Krunomis have evolved from omnivorous ancestors that have become carnivorous as a result of ecological opportunity on the islands. And rats, in particular, are omnivorous. In fact, the genus of true rats is known to feed on birds and their eggs. I'm not arguing apex predator rats are inevitable, as it is possible that other small generalists may take the predatory niches of carnivorans, but I am arguing the idea is not as far-fetched as many people say it is. And, I would argue, it is supported by various examples we see today. So, if we were to imagine a future where our old world rats have become large apex predators, what would they look like? How would they evolve? Fortunately, the degree of parallelism in rodents, especially members of the superfamily, Muridia, while not good for taxonomists trying to classify them, can provide us a good insight into what is a strange idea. So now we have a proper background in what we're dealing with, Let's get started on the evolution of carnivorous rats, 50 million years into the future. We start off with the aftermath of a mass extinction event. The cause of this extinction event, I'd rather keep vapors. Because whether this event was caused by abiotic factors, like volcanic activity, or by man, like nuclear war, doesn't matter. What does matter, is the severity of the extinction event is almost comparable to that of the Permian-Triassic mass extinction event, as 85% of all life was wiped out. This will mostly harm aquatic life as they tend to be more vulnerable during mass extinction events, but terrestrial life will also take a severe impact. This includes ungulates, carnivores, over half of all rodents, and so on. One of those groups that were wiped out were the primates, alongside humanity with them. The only organisms to survive the extinction event would be small generalists. There are many taxonomic groups that make good candidates to survive a mass extinction event as severe as this, like shrews per se. But I will only focus on the subject of this video. 
The rats. The most common species within the invasive genus of ratus is ratus ratus. They initially lived only in the Indian subcontinent, but thanks to human introduction, they are now spread worldwide. They measure up to 16 to 22 centimeters long, with their tails being longer than their body, measuring from 17 to 24 centimeters. They are omnivorous, feeding on plant and animal matter, specifically seeds, fruits, stems, leaves, fungi, and even invertebrates and vertebrates. They also have very short lifespans, living only for 3 to 5 years, and are heavily R-selected, which leads to short generation spans, just like others in their genus, having a generation time of only 0.5 years. These adaptations and their convenient worldwide spread thanks to humans will make them a good candidate for a disaster taxon. So, when conditions recover, a new era, I will call the post-Anthropocene period, will dawn for these organisms once considered annoying pests by us humans. After the extinction event passed, Ratus Ratus will be left with plenty of resources with very little competition and predation. In our present day, studies have already shown increasing gigantism in rats introduced to Polynesian islands 3,000 to 3,500 years ago. Specifically, the species Ratus exulans, where some populations have shown to grow twice the size in contrast to their mainland populations. The size of the rats depended on certain factors like latitude, as some of the largest sizes were found on islands with temperate climates, as a result of Bergman's rule. But as another example, the other largest sizes recorded were on small islands, which held less mammalian species. This allowed more resources for the rats, and thus larger sizes. A similar trend will happen to rats in this scenario, except on a continental scale. Just within a million years into the post-Anthropocene period, these rats will grow from just 5 to 7.2 inches to the size of domestic cats. And due to the variety of ecological opportunities brought by the extinction event, they will undergo an adaptive radiation. One of those radiations leaning into a more carnivorous lifestyle. The size of a species belonging to murines can affect their skull morphology. Herbivorous murines tend to have more robust but shorter skulls with larger zygomatic arches. This is to allow more muscle attachments for continuous consumption of plant matter. Carnivorous murines, on the other hand, tend to have less robust but longer skulls with broader temporal bars. Because feeding on animal matter, with the exception of Durophagus taxa, doesn't require much force when chewing. Carnivores also tend to have larger coronoid processes, with the exception of vermivores, because of the lack of force needed when chewing worms. There are also, of course, trends on the species' dentition depending on their diets. Herbivorous murines tend to have broad, robust incisors while carnivorous species tend to have narrower and longer incisors. This adaptation helps aid in prey capture, cutting, and piercing functions. This is seen in Rinkomis, which has this adaptation as a result of its diet consisting of animal matter, in contrast to the herbivorous Rhabdomys. The molars of herbivorous murines are much larger alongside their crests. Carnivores, on the other hand, again show the opposite trend, having smaller molars with smaller crests, and chevron-like cusps. There may also be some postcranial adaptations in carnivorous rodents. The grasshopper mouse, as an example, have larger claws and humeral epicondyls to help aid in the capture and grasping of prey. All of these polyphyletic adaptations in murines are synapomorphic in this new rat order, Carnimera.